Hi, and welcome to The Gaming, where I'm going to be taking uh, a look at the new uh, Warhammer 40k Tempest of War pack as a comparison with playing the GT missions, really, uh, in here. I'm not going to be comparing it with, say, Maelstrom of War, which might be another obvious comparison, because after years of not playing 40k at all, I only came back for the end of 8th edition, really, and the pandemic meant I didn't actually play any games until 9th, so this is purely a like-for-like -like look at two ways of playing 9th edition completely ignoring the missions in the core rule book that no one plays that I know of anyway. Now, my initial impression is that it has some major advantages over the over the, using the GT missions. I think the GT missions is it's more suitable for actual tournaments, but I think one of its major drawbacks is that the games can be decided like within a turn. Sometimes they can be all over before the second player even gets to play their first command phase, although that that shouldn't be common. That's a, there's, a, there's a big cock up happening there. But the writing can easily be on the wall by the end of the second battle round. This is largely because you can build lists around spamming the most broken units in your codex and building the list around a set of a small number of secondary objectives that you get to choose. Some armies are easier to do with this with than others. Like some armies, for example, get a codex secondary that you will just take all the time or almost all the time. Some get codex secondaries that may be of niche use. And then some will get completely useless ones. You would only ever take them if you wanted to handicap yourself against a weaker player in a friendly game. But there are core secondaries you can build your list around as well. And tactically, unless you come up against a good counter, there's nothing to do in the game itself. You know, you predetermine your army and you predetermine your battle plan for that army. You then execute your battle plan during the game. That's it. That's all you're doing. You're just carrying out an exercise. If it works, there's never any need to do any real thinking other than correctly selecting the right targets for obliteration. With the Tempest of War, you neither choose nor even know your secondaries. You know what the 20 secondaries potentially are, so you can still tailor your army for being able to maximise them. It also doesn't mean you need an army that covers all bases, like you could take blood and guts and overwhelming firepower, for example. One of them requires you to destroy several enemy units in melee and the other one with shooting. And you may think, well, I can't do an army that can reasonably do both. That's OK. Doesn't matter. You know, not only can you spend a command point to get rid of one secondary that you're clearly not going to get and replace it, you don't need them all anyway, even if you have to accept it. You need nine secondaries to be fully completed to cap your secondary points of 45. In addition, you generally don't need to actually cap them to win anyway. You don't generally need 45 secondary points. But let's say you that's obviously what you're going to aim for. Nine. That's all you need to complete. Given that you will have three active at any one time, as long as you're ticking them off now and then and replacing the odd one that's clearly not going to be completed, you don't even need to try and get all the cards you will draw in a game. So it's not like you must design an army that can cover all of them. It's just that you will not be encouraged to spam an overwhelming strength tailored towards a small number of predetermined secondaries. The other part is not knowing what you're going to get on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. Now, this is where there's a good and a bad feature, I think. The bad feature is the look of the draw. It can give one player an easier ride. You can... One player can draw something, oh, I've already achieved that, done, you know. Um, and the other player can look at it and go, well, I might be able to get that in a couple of turns, so I might keep it, but that means there's a couple of turns where that secondary is not productive for me. So it reduces the number of extra secondaries you'll draw in the game. So it can give one player an easy ride, another just placed on luck. Um, so that's why I, I would say not a system for competitive play. It's not, a, the GT system is better for that uh, because the GT mission pack, for all its many faults puts you on more of an even footing uh, and it and it is if it's a big if if you take a maximized competitive list but to a tournament if you don't then you sort of can't really blame anything if it goes poorly but the good feature is you are much less likely to be weighing up the pros and cons at the start of battle round three how often do you get in a situation you uh, at the end of turn two you look at you the situation you go, right, game's over. In a GT mission pack, you can find yourself looking at your choice of secondaries and thinking, and maybe you did make a poor decision, but maybe it was only in hindsight, but you look at it and you go, I'm not scoring any more points on that, am I? 
And then you look at your opponent and you see, because they got the better of turn one and then consolidated in turn two, there's nothing I can do to, to deny you ticking up the points on your secondary choices. And, and you just look at it and you just think, even if things go perfectly for me, there's no way of me now catching up. In Tempest of War, as long as you've got forces available, it's different if you have actually been obliterated, but as long as you've got forces available, you never know what the next cards will bring. And it isn't even just the unknown nature as well. In the GT mission system, you have three secondaries, that's it. If your army is optimized to scoring in those three narrow objective areas, you will score big. In order to camp uh, secondary points in, in Tempest of War, you have to, or caps, you have to uh, achieve nine different secondary objectives. You're potentially trebling the number of different tasks that your army has to be able to achieve, and you don't get to predetermine them. So the game can actually flip one way and then another. And I'm not saying that the Tempest of War system will lead to games going the full duration. I think it's clear they'll be more likely to. You know, after all, some of the, I saw some commentators when 9th edition came out, even ones who'd play tested it. Uh, they said that um, about 9th edition. They said, oh, it would, so the ones who are now saying of Tempest of War, oh yeah, this is much better. This will stop the, the games being over in like eternal. So they said the same thing about 9th edition. They said, oh, it's much closer. Oh yeah, it's quite much closer games than 8th edition. Oh yeah, it goes the distance. Now the same people are saying, yeah, the problem with ninth edition, it can be over straight away, but Tempest of War stops that. So I'm not inclined to fall into the same trap. It may well be that some armies lend themselves to Tempest of War better than others. The system's only just come out, hasn't really been fully tested in the public arena. Um, it may well be that certain metas emerge that are especially effective adapting to the varied and unknown nature of Tempest of War secondaries. You know, while still being strong in the primary, which obviously is virtually the same as the GT missions, I think the main difference there is you generate your layout and your mission rule separately, giving more variety. But I do think the Tempest of War has two massive advantages. First, it's more tactical. You can't have a pre-prepared battle plan and just execute it, only needing to be tactical if your opponent counters it. You have to be tactical in every game because you only know your scoring objectives on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. You can't plan out the whole game the day before or something. You have to consider your plans every turn and adapt. There is much more thought required, even of players who are dominating the game. Obviously in the GT mission pack, if you have your predetermined battle plan that goes wrong straight away, yes, you've got to behave tactically. But if you're the one whose battle plan is working, you don't, you just carry on. You know, um, so you could be dominating the game with a strong combination of list and player, but you still got to be tactical because you don't know where you need to be for the next turn. In fact, so much more tactical is this system, I'd actually suggest it could be good preparation for tournament players going to GTs. Because you can use it to hone your skills in adaptation much better than playing a GT mission. Obviously, you'd still play GT missions as well to get ready for, for those specific missions. Uh, so there can be two strands to your preparation with this. The second massive advantage is that you will not find yourself early on in the game, in turn one if it's really bad, thinking, ah, I can't win now. You know, this is a problem with both Age of Sigma and 40k when it comes to it these days. Never used to happen. When I first started playing fancy in 40k, you, but now you see and hear of it regularly. You know, Tempest of War is a counter to it. It might not plug the gap. It's not a complete uh, panacea. Like, it's a bit like introducing lots of blocking terrain. Start a ninth, the problem was uh, you, people were just obliterating half their opponent's army if they got to go first. So, you know, you counter some of that problem with lots of blocking terrain to soften the apocalyptic nature of having armies capable of wiping out half an opposing army in a single turn. Tempest of War doesn't prevent being wiped out, but it does avoid the situation where you're stuck with secondaries where you can't score or your opponent having secondaries that you can't deny them. It reduces the, the chance of that turn two result by quite a bit. And finally, I do think there's another advantage, but this one's a bit of a mixed bag, so I'm not gonna call it um, a major advantage. And also subjective, so some may not consider it an advantage at all, I do. See, one of my gripes with 40K right now is all the pre-game stuff that takes a while. Problem, when you go to the local club, can't often play 2,000 point games because even in the evening, people obviously play more relaxed anyway, so they're not keeping, but 
just the pre-game stuff to sort out. And a big part of this is setting up. Now, I also host a game at my place most weeks. I could easily set up the table in advance, day before, not a problem. Like I said before, the use of lots of blocking terrain is a must in ninth edition. There are a couple of layouts used in tournaments quite commonly that include like four big blocks of area terrain, then two smaller ones, and then four patches of dense. I could set one of those up ahead of the game, no problem. Only I can't. Because when you roll for the mission, the objectives would end up being in some of these terrain pieces at least. Not allowed in the GT missions, they've got to be out in the open. Now, I've not been part of the debate on that, so I don't know if that rule is really needed. Um, there's obviously some good reason for it, I accept that, but is it worth the extra hassle of having to build in time to set up the terrain after rolling the mission? And this one can help one or other of the players as well. Because there are some armies that don't want terrain. If there's like hardly any terrain, that suits them down to the ground. They're tough enough and have enough firepower to withstand going second. They could go second and go, yeah, you'll take some of me out. And then what's left will obliterate half your army. There are other armies that need the cover. They want the cover. So setting up the terrain quickly to avoiding losing too much game time whilst avoiding the, second, the objectives doesn't give the best results. You know, with Tempest of War, not only can objectives go on or in terrain, but you alternate placing them. So you set up the battlefield before you, before you even need to draw the mission. So you can set that up. You can use a standard template, get it exactly right in advance. Then come the game itself, you draw your cards for mission layout and rule, then you get placed in the objectives without having to monkey about with the terrain. So for someone like me, who doesn't like the faff eaten into the time at the start of the game, and also someone who doesn't see the clear need to have objectives in the open, although I accept that there must be some, then this is another advantage. Like, I'm less keen on the notion of putting the objectives on off the ground, I have to say. I have seen this played where they're on upper floors of buildings. Oh, I don't like that. I do think they should have insisted they be put on the ground floor of buildings. The rules do say they have to lie flat, but not that it has to be at ground level. So that's my mixed bag on that one. But on balance, I do prefer that system. Saves time if you can have the terrain set up in advance. At a local club, you could have tables permanently set up, couldn't you? Just permanently set up. Just go in, sort your objectives out, but the terrain's already set up for you. But those are my initial thoughts. Some things may change, obviously, depending on experience, as I, and I, I play it and I see others play it. But I think my first impression is definitely positive. But let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching. If you found it interesting, please click the like button. And until next time, I'll see you later.